Then, so there was another massive death uh, some weeks after the first one. And in total, it, um, it has been estimated that 75% of the fish, so three quarters of the fish that lived in the Odra died. In this episode, we speak to Eva about the devastating fish kill on the River Oda, just as young ospreys were setting off on migration and learning to feed themselves. Eva, thank you very much for uh, making time to chat to us uh, today. Uh, and whilst we've asked you to speak about a particular incident uh, on the River Oda, uh, earlier this year, right at the start of migration, it was pretty uh, it was pretty dramatic and at a point where we were actually looking at our young ospreys from across Europe just about to start heading off and about to um, to be uh, starting to learn to hunt for their first fish. Um, and whilst your remit is really broad, it covers all of European rivers at the moment, but can we start with uh, young Eva and what made her get into conservation in the first place? Was there a particular moment? I think there was not a particular moment, but I, I always like nature. So I think what attracted me to work in conservation was the beauty and the joy that nature gave to me. Of course, nice landscapes and furry animals <laughs> were the, the first thing to drag me into it. And then that grew into, yeah, studying biology and and working in, in conservation with a bear organization, a panda bear. <laughs> this yeah, case. indeed. Yeah. Um, whereabouts in Spain did you grow up that you had nature around? Well, I, I grew up in Madrid, but I spent most of my summers in, in Doñana wetlands. Uh -huh. in Spain because my dad was from there. And uh, yeah, that was also, that is my link with nature, of course, when you have those amazing landscapes and, and you get so close to, to waterfall, to birds, you see them. You, I, I remember very well the the first time I listened to the to the marshlands at night. It was like magic, no? All this the sounds of the bird at night. When you are used to having a silent nights in the cities, at most cars or or sirens from ambulances. When you go into the wetlands and listen to yeah. that, that, I also remember that as as a magic. And and Doniana is a really important site as well. That's an incredible place to uh, to have been brought up. Yeah, uh, maybe that's why you have this link to water and wetlands, no? Yeah, <laughs> that it kind of explains it. Um, okay, so yeah, down to the down to the serious issue of the river Oda. Can you explain to us from what you know what happened uh, in August this year that resulted in so many fish dying, and how many fish do they do they count? How many died in total? I think uh, what happened in the other is, is happening in other smaller uh, streams. It has been happening, but I think we have never seen it at that scale and so much uh, far north. No, It is a, a mixture between uh, pollution, tra um, transformation of rivers and, and land use around rivers and climate change and increased temperatures. So what happened in the other is that uh, uh, mining companies are, are allowed to throw their dirt into the rivers. With mining companies. Yeah, mining companies, basically. So there is this salty residue coming from mining companies. When it rains, it flushes away. No, it washes away this, this uh, pollution. So for many years in Europe, we have relied on dilution to solve the pollution issue uh, instead of, of treating uh, water. And still, I mean, there is a mixture between treating water, filtering and treating and uh, the dilution factor. But when temperatures increase and when the rivers are so transformed that they are not receiving the water they used to receive because it's stored in dams or because there are dikes preventing the water from um, flooding the, the surrounding of the rivers in the winter and then returning the water to the rivers in the summer. So when the system is so transformed, temperature goes up, then there's not enough water to dilute this pollution. And this is what happened in the other. So this combination of factors, mismanagement, let's say, or not enough ambitious management, probably a lack of control also, and, and, and lack of water and high temperatures, combined also with uh, all the nutrients coming uh, from, from fertilizers in agriculture and from water, uh, wastewater from cities that is in, not enough treated. So what happened is uh, the salinity went up so much from these residues from mining that there was a, a bloom in algae 
that it usually happens, an algae that usually um, grows in the seas, in the coast, not inland. But the salinity was so high that there was an algal bloom. And the salinity, this... the salinity was coming from the mining, not from the sea. Yeah, yeah it was coming from the mining because it was, it was upstream. Um, what happened is that all these algae bloom, bloom, they grew massively. And then the system is not adapted to that. There was not enough water to clean that quickly. Uh, and when all these algae grow, they get rotten. There's nobody that can eat so much algae. No fish can eat so much algae. So at, at first there was this um, fish death because these algae, they're, they're vegetables. You know? So they, they, they need oxygen. They drag oxygen from the, from the water and they're stealing the oxygen from the fish. And they're also covering the surface and blocking the light to come down and uh, other um, other local algae, other good algae from the river and okay. other plants to grow. So it's altering the system completely and it's killing the, the fish by suffocation. They cannot breathe, no? So what, and, what happened in the end? What kind of, how, what, how big was the scale of death of fish on the river? Well, this death of fish caused another, a second death of fish. So in total, uh, so this yeah, first algal bloom, then the al algae die, and the fish that die get uh, rotten, and that uh, causes other algae to grow. So th this is called eutrophication when the when there is too much growth of of algae in the in in the river, and then so there was another massive death uh, some weeks after the first one, and in total it. Um, it has been estimated that 75% of the fish, so three quarters of the fish that live in the other died. Wow. Can you imagine if, I don't know, if you had a farm and 75 of your sheep died <laughs> or, yeah. or if you ran away uh, uh, or if you ran out of 75 of your food at home? Yeah. No, it's, it's not only the impact on the fish that died, it's the impact on the rest of the community that relies on those fish a uh, fisherman also yeah <laughs> at ospreys right yeah uh so many of them and so what what's been the reaction from although well, obviously the the odor flows between right between germany and poland what's been the reaction of people on either side uh well um polish people local polish people were very much concerned they were demanding action from their government uh, German authorities were also demanding action and they were demanding solutions, answers to, to all the questions. Why had this happened? Um, at the beginning, they thought it would have been a, a spill from an industry that killed the fish, but later it, it was seen that it was not an individual spill. It was just that the, yeah, the management was not good. The limits to this, to this residues coming from mining was not good and the control was not good. But surprisingly, um, the Polish government didn't come up with a solution, with a systemic solution saying, okay, let's look at the whole river and let's see what we can make better. Let's improve uh, land use or give room to the river, remove those dams that are not allowing uh, enough water to reach the, the main streets of the other. No, instead of that, they said, we'll make more infrastructure, we'll make more dams, more dikes. And they found the perfect excuse to get European funds to develop uh, additional infrastructure that they need to develop the inland waterways, what is called the E30. So it's instead of making things better, what they are putting on the table is, is just going to make things worse. But we know that uh, the local population is completely against this. And of course, Germany uh, is, is against this because they share the last stretch of the, of the mm -hmm. other. But the... Um, well, the political situation is not favorable, let's say, um, and it's you have to find a balance from the European Commission side, I understand. You have to find a balance where you can uh, put pressure on the countries, but you also need to remain friendly. So governments want to continue to be part of the European Union. So yeah. in this complex balance <laughs> we are right now, and uh, let's hope that the... Um, yeah, the European Commission and also investors, the authorities, the, the investors that are going to lend the money to Poland to do something or to give grants to Poland to do something to solve the other disaster. They also put a control on how that money is spent and for what it is going to be spent. 
surely that kind of thing would come up in an impact assessment, right? If you if they do an impact assessment on the potential uh, construction of whatever extra infrastructure, should they not also look at what would the natural alternatives be? Or uh, no, is that not part of a the system? Uh, yeah, it should be. And when you make an, an environmental impact assessment, you also have to consider the the zero alternative, no? So what mm -hmm. happens if I don't do this? Yeah. Uh, that usually doesn't happen. Um, let's see what happens in, in this case. We also have uh, another European policy, this uh, trans-European network, uh, trans-European transport network uh, policy that is promoting uh, inland waterways as a way to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, again, we have to find a balance no? between reducing carbon emissions using waterways and destroying rivers, building new waterways. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And so, as I've understood it, then the, the mining um, that was part of this issue was happening on pa uh, Polish, Polish territory. Yeah. OK. And so was there a reason that it all exploded at that point or had there been lots of like regular but much smaller fish deaths on the river? Or was this just a point where everything collided? There was too much of that in the water and also river levels dropped due to, to drought and climate change? Well, we had an extreme drought this summer. We hadn't seen a drought like this in 500 years. So it was and especially in, in Central and Eastern Europe. So Poland was very hardly hit by by drought. Um, so the, the increase in temperatures and the lack of rain all over the winter, so it's not only that there was an increase in temperature over the summer, but it came after a warm winter, warm spring, a low rainfall and with very dry soils, soils. So it just exploited at that point because the temperature reaches a limit when, yeah, it's it's an explosion really. <laughs> Yeah, and that that is what happens, and it's worsened by, but as I said, by the all the nutrients uh, coming into the rivers because the the waters are not properly treated, or the farmers are putting too much fertilizers on the soil, and that's reaching the rivers, and that worsens uh, the impact even more. So this pollution combined with increased temperatures and lack of water due to climate change are a very dangerous combination for the Odra and for all the rivers uh, in Europe, and this is impacting not only wildlife no it's impacted impacting people people's lives yeah and when you impact people's life then you get all sorts of other other impacts on our society as well um what do you think the solutions are what's the, what's the, the big picture solution obviously you've mentioned that you don't think in general that engineering is the way out of these uh well we can engineer another way <laughs> We don't need cement to do engineering. We can do green engineering. Uh, I think the, the, and this is a proposal that has already been put on the table, is we need to renaturalize the other, like many other rivers in Europe. No, most of the rivers in Europe are heavily transformed. Uh, the other is transformed, but it's easily reversible, let's say. It's not that transformed. Could be worse <laughs> if you see other rivers like the Rhine, for example. There is room is room for improvement and it would benefit uh, wildlife. It would reduce impacts of climate change. If you, as I said before, if you uh, remove some dams that are not uh, having a very good uh, benefit, they're not, uh, they're not being used, they're obsolete, or they're not producing that big amount of energy or dams that, for which you have alternatives, um, then if you remove dikes and you allow the river to reflood its floodplains to recover its space, then you would be uh, also lowering the risk of floods uh, in cities. If you give the river room where it's not bothering any, any, any housing, then um, it won't have such an impact uh, when it goes through cities or through villages. And um, yeah, recovering the, the, natural functioning of the river system. Think that the earth has been um, turning around for millions of years and rivers are perfectly adapted to do what they are doing. So it is, it is the evolution uh, between rivers and the species living around them for millions of years. They know how to work. And if we allow them to work, if we respect them, we give them some room. Um, of course, conserving part of the infrastructure that we have built because we 
Europe is so transformed, we cannot pretend to renaturalize everything 100%, but there is a lot of room to renaturalize uh, these rivers, to allow them to work, to do their job, and yeah, get flooded when they have to, and that uh, absorbs water, retains water into the soil, which allows them to uh, have drinking water also, because in many places in Europe, drinking water comes from, from the ground, from groundwater. And that comes from rainfall and it, especially from, from floodplains that I think that's when the water slows down and can trickle down into the soil and reach the, the groundwater. So all these uh, measures to renaturalize rivers would benefit uh, people and in some cases would even lower the cost of administrations. Mm -hmm. So they, if they do the investment here, this cannot be seen as an expense. It's an investment on which you are going to have return because if you invest in nature, then you are avoiding cost of um, building new dams because you don't have enough water in the groundwater or treating water or uh, compensating uh, city dwellers for flood damage or, or for fish deaths. And who is going to compensate us for the loss of landscape? That's something that no government is paying for, but we suffer it, no? That that landscape that you saw all your life, that river, I cannot think of the people living by the banks of the other when they saw those millions of dead fish floating in the surface. That must be really, really dramatic. And when that's part of your life, when that, that's, as Doñana was part of my, of my childhood, I couldn't think of Doñana full of dead fish. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Nothing can compensate that. So should we, and I'm talking the general public across Europe and across the UK, should we be worried about this kind of thing happening at other places, at rivers near us? Um, yeah, we, <laughs> I think this is probably the extreme. This is the tip of the iceberg that, that we are seeing. But there are many other things that we are not seeing happening with our rivers across Europe. So, for example, we have lost 93% of migratory fish uh, in our rivers. So I'm talking about salmon, eels, trouts, many other species that are less known. Um, but we lost 93% of, of those fishes all over Europe. They're under, under the surface of water. So it's not so obvious as when you see them. Uh, Dead and floating, no? Um, the, the damage is there. There is room for recovery still, but there is a huge risk with, with climate change. And we know that the heat wave and the drought that we had this summer uh, with the temperature increase that we already had is going to be 20 times more likely than it was years ago. And if we don't manage to get these negotiations in Egypt right now yeah. uh, seriously, and if the G20 doesn't take this seriously, uh, it's going to be worse if we reach the, the two degrees of, degrees of temperature increase. It's going to get much worse. What can we do? Well, um, I think most of the people are increasingly um, uh, aware of this. And you can do things on your personal life, like choose what you buy, what you eat. Uh, lower meat consumption and go for meat that is uh, better produced because meat has a huge impact on the on the temperature increase uh, of the planet. Um, you can choose what you wear, how much time you wear it, mm -hmm. how high your heating is at home, if you walk on or get your car. Uh, there are many personal decisions. And of course, you can choose who you vote and who represents you taking those decisions at country level and at, at those international meetings where the big decisions are, are being taken. Mm -hmm. And we can also go to the street and shout from time to time to wake them up. <laughs> yeah, I think that's also necessary um, to make some noise. We cannot uh, sit back and relax and expect the governments to fix it because they're not doing it by now, no? Or not as fast as they should. That's been really fascinating. And don't we to have gone from the uh, the survival of an individual osprey uh, on migration and was or wasn't it going to um, uh, yeah trip up with the sort of uh, fish deaths um, to yeah it's interesting to see basically how that connects to the global issues that we're that we're all talking about um, at the moment 
Uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Eva. Thank you. Thank you, Seta.